our uh, guest speaker is Vance Benda, one of our um, longtime installers. Um, done a lot with James Way, taught a lot of our installers. Um, been with James Way about 10 years installing equipment. He is on location now at an installation, like I said, in Pennsylvania. So he's uh, coming to us from his hotel room <laughs> today. So um, he doesn't have the background that, that I do. Um, uh, he, before his time with James Way, he was with uh, Embrex, and, and then he worked before that in some, for some research um, data gathering before that his time at the university. So a lot of experience in, in uh, incubation and poultry, a lot of tremendous experience with installations. One of the first times I met Vance, um, he started talking to me about wiring and alarms and my head was spinning as fast as it could spin because he just was spewing all that information right out. So he's the man if you've got questions about anything about alarms, wiring or whatever in, in our uh, machines. So I'm um, also at the end of the or, or at the end of this, we'll be recording the session. You'll get a, uh, everybody that's registered will get a link that'll have this recording. You can watch it later, share it with other people. And um, so a lot of good information here. Um, next week, uh, we will have a webinar um, as well next week, a very good topic on assessing chick quality. I have a guest lecture from Avigen with us. Um, and, uh, and then following week, we'll talk about uh, managing those chicks to get optimum three and seven day livability in the farm. So next two weeks we'll have guest lectures and there'll be good topics as, as well. So um, with that, let's go ahead and get started with our webinar this morning. Um, and so I will uh, turn the time over to Vance Benda. James Way, we share your screen and we'll just let you get rolling with that. All right. Thank you, Doc. So I have to go. Already messed up. No, just go all the way. All right. Good morning. Get I'm your Vance. presentation though, Vance. Oh. All right. Sure. Good morning. I'm Vance Benda. As Doc said, I'm an installation supervisor with James Lee. And here's my contact info. You're welcome to call me or anybody else at James Lee at any time if you have any problems or questions. So let's get right into alarms. And so I'm gonna go over the few, first few slides, I'm gonna go over just uh, a lot of concepts and um, get us all on the same page. So what is an alarm? An alarm is a system or series of systems that are usually audible, audible visual, or other means such as call out to make you aware there is a problem. And you may also have another system in your hatchery. We're, um, we're going to be talking about primary alarms and high temp backup alarms, but you may also have Hatchcom. And Hatchcom is a good example of other means because it talks to you by sending um, information to your computer. But anyway, so you have the possibility of having up to three systems that are making you aware there's a problem. We will, again, we'll be covering primary alarms and high temperature backup alarms. Primary alarms are uh, any one of a number of alarms that can be generated directly from your incubation equipment. You, most people out there are gonna be familiar with, you know, you have uh, some examples would be uh, high temperature, low temperature, um, high humidity, low humidity, turning, there's, there's a long list of things that can make your uh, incubator send an alarm. Now high temperature backup alarms, on the other hand, is a redundant independent system that makes you aware of over temperature situations only. Once you know, as I said before, your incubator already has a high temperature alarm, but this, this system is, is, is redundant, independent, and backs up your incubator if something were to go wrong with a temperature probe or something on your incubator, this system's there to help catch high temp situation before, hopefully before you do any damage to any embryos. So how does an alarm system work? Well, the primary alarm system uses a series of relays. Uh, the relay that's in your incubator is called K3. The one that's in your alarm control box is called K2, but it uses these these uh, relays 
It allows your one electromechanical device to send or stop sending the signal to another. So this, uh, we send this signal through what is called an alarm loop. You're gonna hear me talking about this loop and how long these can get to be in some of these bigger hatcheries. And this is just simply the wiring that connects all these relays and allows them to, you know, one device to basically communicate to another device. You're, you're gonna hear me talking a lot about series wiring and it's easiest to describe as inline or one path, while parallel wiring is best described as all together or many paths. And the most important thing about alarms is not the alarm itself, but the response to the alarm. If I reach over there on my wall and pulled the fire alarm and the fire department never shows up, the alarm was pretty much useless. So let's just keep that in mind. Response to alarms is far more important than alarm itself. So this, this picture, this is not an actual alarm system, but I like this picture because it helps me explain parallel wiring and as, as I said, it's best described as um, all together. Basically, all these things are hooked and there's many paths the electricity can go. You see them right here. And if you had more and more machines connected, you would just have more and more paths. This is real old school. If you have a hatchery that um, was built in the 70s or maybe the early 80s, you may have this wiring system in your hatchery and, and the, the way it works is almost completely opposite from series. This thing only sends a signal back to your control box when there's alarm condition. The, the series alarm um, sends voltage continuously for no alarm and keeps a relay latch. This, uh, back in the day, you know, when these systems were put in, almost all of them were connected to, just simply connected to a 12 volt horn. Now this picture, again, this is not an actual alarm system but this is just a good little picture to help you understand that's what series wiring is so it's one path the electricity can only flow there's no uh only one way it can go and so this is that and, the, and this and the coupled with the fact that <clears throat> anytime these machines are running normally voltage is flowing from the control box back to the control box and holding that relay open and that system makes, that, that fact makes this system much more fail safe than your parallel wiring. This system too can be wired to a horn, but nowadays with all the high technology, a lot of times we're uh, connecting them to uh, tone generators, intercom systems, strobe lights. We can do a lot of things because we have these, we're using relays and the relays will isolate whatever you want to do and what we're doing with our alarm system. And uh, well, the, even though this is a series of alarm, the alarm relay and bypass switch are wired in parallel. So if, if the bypass switch were here, it would be wired from this point to here. That would give this electricity, you could, the electricity would go through the relay or if you bypass the machine, it could go through the switch. But we'll get to that in just a minute. Now, I got to have this slide up here because there's, you know, there's always options of, on where you mount the alarm box, but I basically want to show everybody how, how long these loops can be. So here we have our control, our alarm control down here. If you follow the wire, it goes up through, through these incubators, across, through these incubators, across, through these incubators. Then we go over here to your hatcher and it does the same thing. It just works its way through all these hatchers. And so that's, that's when I say uh, these alarm loops can get incredibly long. That's a long one there. We can make it work if, if this is how you choose, you know, choose, but we could also do different things. We could, we could, uh, and <clears throat> if you were running this system, you're just gonna have one horn. And when it goes off, all you're gonna know is that it was either an, an incubator or a hatcher is alarming. You don't know which one. So we could do a, a couple of other things. We could mount one alarm box here, one alarm box here, and connect those to horns that make different sounds. So you have one sound for your incubators, one sound for your hatchers, and that's also gonna cut down on the uh, length of your loops. Cause now 
if you were connected, if you had your box here, your loop's gonna go through, back up and through and would stop right here. Same with your hatcher. If your box was mounted here, your loop would stop over here. Much shorter loop and um, two different sounds. One for an incubator, one for a hatcher. Now this is, this, is, this is a picture of an actual alarm loop. And again, I wanted to use the last slide to, to point out that this loop can be incredibly long at times. So whenever you start talking about this power supply over here, you have to realize that you have to have a, a, a supply enough power to, to make it out through that long loop, through all these relays, and back to this uh, K2 relay to keep it latched. Because if this relay is unlatched, now these, these drawings, they have everything kind of sprawled out just so you can understand what you're doing. These contacts are actually contained inside this relay. So anytime you're connected to normally closed contacts, and um, for anybody that doesn't understand the concept of normally closed, normally open, normally closed, is, um, that's what happens when power, when this coil has no power on it, these contacts are gonna close. Normally open, if, if this uh, relay didn't have power, it would be open. Work um, in the series wired alarm system, we're wired to normally close, uh, normally close contacts. So if anything happens out here to, to stop the flow of electricity to this coil, you fall on normally closed contacts and this horn is gonna blow. On a, on a parallel wired system, your horn's gonna be connected to uh, normally open contacts. So these, these re the, um, whenever, whenever this uh, relay is de-energized, de these contacts are open. Now, if, if this was a parallel wired system, the, you would have, you'd be, again, you'd have this switch and the relay would be wired across here in parallel and you'd have many paths of, for the electricity to flow. And it, if the electricity, if a machine alarmed, it's gonna send voltage only during alarm condition, latch this relay, which is gonna close these contacts. So you, at that time, your battery is actually doing two things, latching this relay and blowing your horn. On the series system, your, your battery um, is gonna be doing one of two things at any given time. It's either going to be latching this relay or blowing the home, but it never does both at the same time. And a couple, the other thing we would talk about real quick on this box is this little diode right here. Now notice, here's your positive side of your battery <clears throat> connected to the BBB terminal, but yet the negative side of this diode is connected to the, so to the positive terminal and the positive uh, side of the diode is connected to the negative terminal. So this guy's in reverse polarity. And what these, what these diodes do, they're called flyback diodes or snubbers. What these guys do is when you remove voltage from this coil, that creates a little spike and this diode helps uh, take care of that. Pretty important. So when, when I, think, I think we just um, covered everything on that gray box pretty good, but like again, we just we want to be aware of the diode. We want to be aware that you're connected to normally closed contacts. And we all and when we're building these alarm systems, we have to consider our power supply. And again, this loop is going to be considerably longer than what we have in these pictures. And, and that's what determines the size of the power supply required. And here again is your loop. I want you to realize this is a uh, that this wire and this wire in, in the real world are, are gonna be contained in one two conductor. So this two conductor is gonna come in, one of your wires is gonna to connect to this terminal, and then the, this wire is gonna come in and have another connection right here so that it can conduct, connect to the two conductor that's going out and over to the next machine here. And so another terminal is gonna be connected here and go out and over and connect to the next machine so forth and so on. So that's, that's your loop and that's the link, you know, where, where all this length comes from is all, all that wire you have to pull. 
Now, knowing that you have this connection right here um, in the real world, um, you can easily, so right now, so right, if you look at this, this is your black wire, and this is, say, your white wire, or maybe your red wire. On the last machine in the loop, so this is going to be black and black, black and black, and black right here. On the last machine, you know, this wire, the red wire or white wire, depending on what kind of two conductor you use, is going to be connected here. Now, knowing you have this connections here, you can easily, by manipulating, disconnecting this connection, disconnect this connection, and move this wire up to here, you can eliminate a whole bunch of machines in that loop for troubleshooting purposes. And that's real handy. Back to your hatchery layout, you're in a hatchery of this size and you're having major alarm problems. We could easily, if, if this is how you, uh, where you chose to mount your alarm box, we can easily follow, go up here to this first row of machines, uh, manipulate a few wires, and we, and we have eliminated all the rest of these machines from your alarm loop. So we can focus on trying to just get this row going. Once we get that row going, we can come down here and do the same thing again after we um, put these connections back to normal. Now we now we'll concentrate on getting this row going and so forth and so on. So that's pretty handy little troubleshooting tool for you guys out there in incubation world. Now we're gonna talk about inside the actual control panel and uh, what, you know, I, I spoke a lot about all this already, but, but we're gonna go over it in, in uh, real time. Here's your diode. There's, and there a diode has a little stripe painted on one end to indicate the negative end of the diode. And this is your positive. Follow this wire back, it goes right here. This is your um, power supply wire coming in. Connect to terminal one. The other positive terminal on this strip is terminal two. And that's the, that red wire right there is the positive lead going to your horn. So once again, I told you in a, pair, in a series wired alarm system, your DC voltage has two choices. When it gets to here, you see your um, parallel wire, the positive terminal is connected to both terminal B of your relay. And over here, it's connected to a normally closed contact on the top tier of your um, relay which means anytime this, uh, this relay loses power, voltage is gonna go through this normally closed contact right on that yellow wire and go out and blow your horn. If voltage goes out on your loop and makes it back, this relay is gonna latch and the horn is gonna be silent. So once again, your battery is always doing something. Your power supply is always doing something in the fail safe alarm system. So let's talk about the uh, with the alarm loop. Here you can see in these three terminals, terminal three, four, and five are um, negative terminals. Here's your, you see your negative uh, power supply wires connected to four, four's jumper to three. Here's your alarm loop connection going out. Here's your alarm loop connection returning. If voltage makes it back, a sufficient voltage makes it back to this terminal, it goes through your quarter amp fuse goes up here to terminal A and latches this relay and silences your horn. As Soon as you take that voltage away, this relay falls out, your horn starts blowing. So that's, and all that is part of the fail safe system. This system is uh, pretty good. Now the last thing I wanna talk about on the, on the primary alarms is our new 24 volt machine and how the bypass and everything works. Now, if you notice everything else, this control box, all that's the same, which means you could have new 24 volt platinums connected to um, P2s, um, P1s, multi-stage. You can use the same loop. You could connect to um, any of our previous machines, but on our previous machines, you notice in the, in the diagrams I showed you, there was actually a manual bypass switch which means on those machines, you had to actually, well, when you disconnect power to the machine, you had to do a two-step process. You had to shut the disconnect off and turn the alarm bypass on. Our 24-volt platinum, the alarm bypass is actually mechanically connected 
to the main power disconnect. So anytime you walk up to a 24 volt platinum and shut the power down, you're automatically bypassing it. Pretty handy, pretty handy and good thing to know. So now we're gonna go right into uh, your high temp backup alarm. And, then, and this is what it looks like. And again, this is, I want everybody to understand this system is completely independent of your incubators. You have a thermostat on the roof of your incubator and this this box does not communicate with your incubator in any way or hatchcom or anything it's independent separate system now <clears throat> there are two systems out there and the older older system is a mercury type system and it uses a free conductor wire between the uh, control panel and the thermostat and the mercury free system we pull a five conductor from the um, control panel to the thermostat, but it uses the same control panel. So if you're running a mercury system, at some point in time, everybody knows mercury is uh, going away sometime in the near future. So we may have to convert your mercury system over to a uh, mercury free system, which is gonna require that we pull, pull that old free wire out and pull five conductor in and change your uh, thermostat box. Now on the front of this box, you don't have a, you have a, this black button. If, if uh, and there's 16 circuits on each one of these control panels. So in other words, this box can service 16 incubators or 16 hatchers. If you ever wanted to disable the high temp circuit, you can just press that button and your green light would go off. There wouldn't be any lights. These red lights, those are what flash when you have an alarm condition. And also you have this light down here flashing when you have an alarm condition on any one of these circuits. And here we simply have a test button. You can press that to make sure that on all your circuitry, circuitry is intact. And then after you press the test button, you're gonna to wanna to reset it. All right. And calibration is critical on um, mercury free. So we should, uh, <clears throat> while we're on the subject of the control panel, we just want to understand what all those lights do. So again, if you press your um, disable button, you won't have any lights lit on that circuit. You go and turn your circuit back on and the incubators are operating at normal temperature, you're simply going to have a green light. If, so, if, if uh, something happens inside your incubator causes the temperature to go above your set point, the, the red light on the individual circuit's gonna flash, and that global alarm light down in the bottom left of the control panel is gonna flash. And then if you have this situation, we've got a problem out of your thermostat. It's either disconnected or your cables have been cut or something. But anyway, we'll go move on into the... So now we're um, looking at the inside of an actual alarm box. Now we, we talked about relays and everything and how they isolate one system for another. Just realize that here you have a 12 volt power coming into this machine on, on this five conductor here that's coming from another power source external to this system. So this relay serves to isolate this um, system from whatever you're doing here. Again, you could be hooking this to a horn um, tone generators, uh, strobe lights, there's several things we can do, but it's important that we use this relay to isolate anything you're doing external from this machine. Because we have, uh, the reason I want to point this out is we have 12 volt negative here, 12 volt positive here, and ground here. And I've had people try to use the power generated by this system to do things external to this system and that's not good this power supply is only only on function should be to drive your thermostats here's your uh here's your thermostat wires going out there will be 16 of them um two wires connected up here all your whites connected here and jump and all, they're all jumper together and getting their dc negative right there here's all your browns you're getting your dc positive and they're all jumper together. You always want to make sure to keep these little jumper screws tight. And then here's your ground. See the green wire coming in here? They're all jumper together. And that's about all, 
Oh, and on the uh, up here is your 110 coming in. Um, we we always recommend um, that you have your electrician run this 110 directly to a breaker of the appropriate size over in your breaker panel and not just simply um, plug it into a wall plug or a GFI or something like that. All right. So, oh, and uh, what, what this customer has done here is again, we wanna, this system, um, when we, we sell you this system, you're gonna get this box and your thermostats and we supply the five conductor. When we, wire, once we have this thing wired up, um, obviously we, um, if you have an alarm, you know, all those lights out there will flash and everything like we talked about. And this relay, when, when, the, when, the, when this alarms, this relay is gonna de-energize. So what this customer does, is it hooked a 12 volt power supply. We have 12 volts standing by on this side of the relay, hooked to uh, normally closed contacts. So when the relay's energized, the, the contacts that we're hooked to are open, and this is your horn over here, so nothing happens. As soon as, uh, as, soon as this uh, alarm occurs, this relay is gonna de-energize. You're hooked to normally closed contacts, you're gonna sound a horn. All right, now this, this is your uh, thermostat uh, mounting location. This is a P120. Um, and so this is the middle of a P120 where the air comes in through this real nice uh, air intake duct. So this, from here back would be the rear zone of the P120 and from here forward would be the front zone of the P120. And this thermostat is mounted right at the split between the two zones which is the preferred mounting location. It's also mounted 44 inches off this, uh, off the left wall, and that puts it right in the center of your egg mass. And then you can see the wire goes in, goes in right here, and goes into the low voltage side of your um, incubator. Low voltage is always on the left. This track over here is for high voltage. This, but this does not mean that this wire is connected to your incubator. It simply goes, into the low voltage track, up to the front, and out, up and out through one of these conduits over to your control panel. Very important to understand that that uh, high temp backup alarm is not connected to your incubator in any way. Now we'll talk a little bit about this high temp uh, backup alarm wiring. Um, uh, as I mentioned, each one of these boxes can uh, service 16 incubators. So if you were to count, this is 10, and then he's got connected to six more. So this box is full, taking care of 16 incubators. This one over here, he picks up these four and these 10. So you're gonna have a couple empty circuits on that box, which that's fine. And uh, we always try to um, locate these high temp uh, control panels relatively close to the incubators because Again, you have five conductors. This is not, not a loop like you're a primary alarm. This is individual five conductors going from this box to this stat, this box to that stat, so forth and so on. Same thing with your hatchers. We have a high temp backup alarm control box mounted relatively close to the hatchers. This guy right here, he's taking care of these six and this one's taking care of 12. So you have uh, some empty circuits up here as well, but that's fine. All right. Now this, now we're gonna talk about the actual thermostat. And uh, Doc put, you, if you have this instruction um, with your height, you'll notice this right here on, your, on the current instruction, it just says um, CDE not used. But Doc put this in here for me so I can explain something about an old thermostat we used to have. Um, as you can see up here, this, <clears throat> this uh, thermostat card has rotary switches. So, and that's how you determine your set point. If we turn this one, all these are set on zero right now. But if you turn that arrow to one, turn that one to one, you'd be on, on 101. If you turn this one to one and this one to five, you'd be on 100.5. Again, this is hundreds, tenths, ones, and thousands. Here you have your calibration. We're gonna we're gonna look at an actual picture and we'll go over this. This um, 
the main thing we wanted to cover here on this slide is very important. This, uh, there's little shunts right here, little jumper, little pins sticking up. And for, for this system to work as intended, we have to ensure we put a, a shunt on jumper position B. And that means um, with, that, with that shunt in, in position B, if this machine was operating at normal temperature, this LED is going to be on. We're connected to normally closed contacts. So that, and, and this right here says the relay is active. So when the relay is active, this normally closed contact is going to be held open. We're not sending a signal. As soon as this uh, alarm go, if it goes over this set point, this machine went over this set point, your green LED dot light would go off and the relay would close these contacts, would fall, would lose energy, and you're connected and normally closed. Uh, I want to talk real quick about the, uh, the older thermostat. Some of you may still be running it, so we'll just touch on that. <clears throat> so you only, have, you only have three temperature selections. So if you put a, if you put a jumper on the C, your temperature set point is 101. If you put on D, your temperature set point is 105, and if you, which is what we recommend for platinum hatchers, this is what we recommend for 101 is for platinum incubators. And then you also have one uh, selection. If you put it in the E position, it'd be 100 degrees. Some people might use 100 degree set point on multi-stage, but what we commonly use this for is calibration. So if you're doing a calibration on this and you have this type of thermostat, you would, if you're doing an incubator, you would move your shunt from C down and put it on E. Then we'd, we'd have to go down and tell the incubator to go to 100 degrees. And then we'd, we'd have to press the calibration button once our electric firm tells us that the machine has reached exactly 100 degrees. So calibration on these is a little tougher than calibration on, on this. And we're gonna talk about that in just a little bit, much better. So uh, here's our uh, high temp alarm box, actual picture of one. As, as I said, there's rotary switches up here. And if you look, you can see this one set on one, zero, one, zero. That's 101 degrees. I'm assuming this is on the roof of an incubator. Here's your calibration test button, or I mean your calibration button. And it's hard to see, but there's your shunt right there in the, in the B position. And there's your LED lit up. That tells me that this is um, not only mounted on the roof of the incubator, the incubator is running under 101 degrees, and there's no alarm, so everything's good. All right. Now, calibrating the... Uh, the thermostat box is, is very important um, because if you if it's not calibrated correctly, it's not going to go off when you expect it to. So um, calibrating the, and calibrating this high temp um, thermostat is a lot of the, a lot of you guys are going to be familiar with this some of these uh, phrases from calibrating regular incubators. But you're basically going to want your incubator to be on, and you're going to want it to be at operating temperature. We recommend um, calibration 12 to 24 hours after you set the machine because, you know, right when you set a machine, it's, in, you know, it's, it's heating, trying to heat eggs up. It's, it's not stable and, um, and we want to wait till the temperature is stable. And as it says in um, number two here, a machine with eggs is way more stable than an empty machine. And that, that's what we're looking for is stable. Another thing that will uh, destabilize your machine while you're trying to do calibration is humidity. Because everybody knows humidity has a slight cooling effect. So every time your humidity comes on, your heat's gonna um, come on to compensate for that uh, cooling effect. So while you're doing calibration, be sure to uh, just disable your humidity. Now, we're gonna talk about the electrotherm and probe. Um, it's very, like I said, you want to make sure you get a good calibration. So it is critical that <clears throat> we calibrate the electric firm. It's also critical that when we send it off to calibration, we send it with, with the probe that you're going to be using. 
And it's also critical once that once you know this cal this electrotherm and probe are, are calibrated, you keep these two together. That I mean, because um, you just don't want to mix probes. Uh, a lot of a lot of hatcheries will have three or four electrotherms, and uh, one system I saw to keep make make sure the electrotherm and probe stay together. They had one um, ele electrotherm had blue tape on it and blue tape on the probe. Another electrotherm had red tape and red tape on the probe. Anyway, very important, make sure you do not mix these electrotherms and probes up or you won't have an accurate uh, calibration. So anyway, back to the statement, we insert this calibrated uh, electrotherm probe into the calibration hole on the roof of your machine and allow the, allow the electrotherm to um, stabilize. That means you're actually looking at your electrotherm and the temperature's not jumping around, it's stable. We'll, um, remove the cover on your um, high temp backup alarm thermostat box and you're going to turn the rotary dials to match what your electrotherm says. Once you do that, glance back down at your electrotherm, make sure it's still saying what you've turned these dials to and press the calibration button. Then you next thing you're going to, and you'll see the green light flash when you do that. And then you're going to want to turn your rotary dials back to the desired high temperature set point. Now, <clears throat> every time you do this calibration procedure, you're actually setting the alarm off. So this is also a good time to just go downstairs and verify that you've got a red light flashing on your control panel. But anyway, once you, once you return your temperature rotary dials back to your set point, which on platinum incubators is one on one, Platinum hatchers is uh, 100.5. You can go ahead and replace that cover and you're, and you're pretty much done. All right, so now we're getting to my conclusion. So, you know, alarms, we talked a lot about alarms, but it's not the alarm itself that's important. It's the response to the alarms. If you don't have, you know, if you're, if you're not taking care of alarms, you're probably not gonna have a successful operation. Um, a little bit of good news is many, if not all, of the older parallel non-failsafe alarm systems can be converted to failsafe. If, if you're interested in doing that, um, contact your salesman or uh, Dr. Uh, Bramwell or anybody, and, and, and let's get a technician out to evaluate your wiring and see what, what all we're gonna have to do. But we can most often convert your old systems as well as your mercury high temp backup alarms can be converted to mercury free. But as I said earlier, just be aware that when you do it, you're going to have to replace your, um, your mercury thermostats and you're going to have to replace that old three conductor wire with five conductor. All right. And, you know, at James Way, we, we strive to make our machines as, as worry free as possible. Not only our machines, but our processes, the um, recommendations, but, um, you know, no machine is ever going to be built that doesn't have a problem from time to time. So worry-free does not equal the absence of problems, but it refers to your team's ability to deal with problems. And then, of course, everybody knows what really makes a good hatchery is good people. So again, I think that's about all I have on alarms. And we are going to, if anybody has any questions, please send them to me. Um, send them, actually you'd be sending them to this webinar's address and if, I, if there's something somebody, that was pretty much it. I hope you all enjoyed my show. All right. Thank you much, Vance. Again, a lot of information there about wires going this way and that way and all that stuff, um, which we've got to have good wiring and good alarm system our hatchers. Can you talk about it, and you and I have talked about this before. So. In a hatchery, and you've seen this, I've seen this, the hatchery alarms go off, what should be the first response? I mean, we've seen a lot of different responses. You and I have talked about this. What do people do? All of a sudden, an alarm goes off. What, what should they be doing right away? Well, I mean, like I said, I've, I've been in it, working in hatcheries for uh, 15 years, and if if you want to know if you're in a good hatchery or a bad hatchery, you stand in, if you stand in front of an incubator, and it has an alarm and nobody ever shows up, there might be a problem. But you know, when the alarm goes off, well, uh, 
the first thing you want to do is go find out what type of alarm you have going off, where it's going off, and, and there's different responses to different problems. If you have a turn failure, you're probably going to have to go in the machine and start do, um, do some digging around, checking airlines. If you have a high temp situation, you got to figure out what's going on there. You could have some, you know, a stuck solenoid. Uh, just every every different type of primary alarm has is going to have a different response, and it, it, it it's real important that your people are trained to how to handle each different type of alarm. But the most appropriate response is to respond, correct? <laughs> yeah, actually go to the machine and yeah. see what's going on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you and I have both seen that. We've all seen that to where you know, the hatchery alarm is going off and all of a sudden there's silence from somewhere else. And, and yeah, so looks. On, on Hatchcom, um, uh, the incubator has what's called a net, network alarm screen. So if somebody's just going to the network alarm and say, uh, they're at one end of the hatchery and they look on that network alarm screen and they say, oh, uh, incubator at the other end of the building had a turn alarm. If they just silence it and, wa and walk away, you know, that's what I consider a terrible response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, is there, is there systems, I know you got, we've got backup alarms and other alarms. Is there a system where you've got different sounds for different types of things for high temp, turn, failure, or whatever, or yeah, like, those places have the same sound? Well, like I was saying, uh, usually, um, it, especially if you mounted two, if you if you broke that loop out into hatchers and incubators, and put one box for hatchers, one box for incubators, then you would have you would connect those to a horn, two different horns, and 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 also when you connect a horn to your high temp backup alarm, you would want to pick a horn with a third sound. I mean, you don't have to, but I wouldn't want one one tone meaning you know, I mean, you have an alarm, what alarm? Is it high temp, is it incubator, is it hatcher? So I, I would definitely want several different sounds. And a lot of people do this, or some people are doing it nowadays with, uh, they don't even have a horn. They ha actually have a recorded voice that'll come and tell you, come over to the PA and say, uh, incubator alarm, incubator primary alarm, hatcher primary alarm, high temp backup alarm. So, there's so, so the options there, the options there to to be very specific to what the issue yeah. is and where it's at. All of these alarm systems, like I say, we have that relay, and as I explained, a relay um, is you know it, it's an elect it's electromechanical device. It's really be thought of as a switch, but it also isolates anything you want to do as far as like tone generators, horns from our system. Just, just like the the way the alarm system's wired, the alarm voltage doesn't actually doesn't actually um, go through the incubator. It just passes through the relay. There's no voltage exchange at all. So, being that the alarm systems work with the relay, we can do a lot of things. I'll you know anybody if you're out there designing a hatchery and, and you can't figure it out, we have people at James Way you can call um, Renee just. Um, we can we can figure out how to how to make it do a lot of different things. Yeah. There's there's options and we can kind of help you with those options. Yeah, I, one one of the questions was and you talked about a little bit in here maybe to reemphasize a little bit. Is it necessary to have a, a standby battery in your alarm system? And what if somebody doesn't? Well, the the primary alarm system. Um, that there are there are people that do not have a battery. They, like I said, some people run off a of UPS, uninterrupted power supply. I think that's the best choice. And the UPS actually has a battery in it. That's, that's why it's called an uninterrupted power supply. But there are some hatcheries that run a, uh, a modulated power supply. Well, if the voltage go, if the 110 voltage that drives that modulated power supply goes out or gets unplugged or whatever, your alarm system is going to go down. And if, and if there's a, if there's a pause between your hatchery losing uh, power and the generator kicking on, your 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 alarm system is going to have a little bleep in there, but it's not going to work properly until that until you get that um, voltage back up. Again, I explained how how important having the a, a, 
a DC power supply that will amp that drives that voltage out through that long loop and has enough amps to return enough energy to latch that relay. Okay, here, here's some little bit of troubleshooting questions. Here's one um, from one of our attendees on here. Again, thank you for all your questions. And, um, so if you've got a machine that that keeps having turn failures without an alarm, what, how would you address that? Where's the first thing you would go to look for? If, if you know there's turn failures, but the alarms are just, they, they don't respond. Is it a platinum machine? I, I don't know how just respond to both maybe a multi-stage and maybe okay, so so if it's a if it's a multi-stage machine with the you know with the mercury um turn switches you're gonna you're gonna be start looking at things like your turn cables and stuff like that if it was a platinum machine and you tell me that it's turning it's it's not turning but you're not getting alarmed then your turn pressure switches on it just correctly probably Okay, so so it, okay. So what are what are some of the other more common alarm failures you've seen? Either, either from the equipment function that's causing the alarm failure, or the alarm system to not respond like it's supposed to. It's kind of a two part question. So, uh, so, so like, what would be a more common um, um, alarm failure? Like failure of your alarms to work, and and why would that occur? Well. Like I, like, like I said, you can't make any system completely fail safe, but for, um, so you have a series wired alarm system and somebody goes up and yanks that K, um, that, that relay out of the control box. Well, you're not going to get an alarm because you just pulled all the contacts out. Or if we went, if we would, if you, that picture I had inside the control panel, if you looked at that wiring, you'd notice that the red wire going to the horn didn't have a spade on it and it was about to fall loose. Well, if that, if the, if obviously if the positive wire going to the horn fell off, you're not going to get a horn, even though the relay is still clicking. So maybe somebody's done some changes in there and haven't hooked everything back up right. Well, one thing that I, that I know, you know, we had discussions with you and I was with one of our other consultants at, at a hatchery and they, um, um, had a situation where they just couldn't get the alarms to turn off and then looking at it, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but something went wrong somewhere along the way. And when the local people tried to put everything back together in the right spot, they did not. Right. And from that standpoint, nothing's working right. And those are pretty difficult to, to troubleshoot. How would you go about troubleshooting that? If Obviously, it's just something is wrong with the whole system. Something's been changed. How do you go about troubleshooting that? Well, that box, <clears throat> like I said, there's, um, and, and that box that I used, the, the, the uh, primary alarm control box um, picture that I used in my talk, that picture was sent to me because somebody was in the process of rewiring it, and they wanted me to check it to make sure it was hooked up correctly. So if something's, if, and, and just realize if somebody hooked a power supply up and they, and they had the polarity wrong, well, the system's not going to work. If you put the diode in there backwards, the system's not going to work. If um, you know if the relay itself went bad, the system's not going to work. So troubleshooting the alarm system, you know, the first thing I'm going to check is: Are you sending voltage out? And like I said, a, a common problem with this alarm system is they're hooked to some inadequate power supply. They're sending voltage out on that incredibly long alarm loop but they're not driving it with enough amps to come home and latch the relay. So again, you would just check from terminal one to five and find out how much voltage you're driving back home. So you kind of have to go in series and steps like that along the way and say, you know, make, okay, this area is right, then this area is right and find out where. Yeah, yeah. you just have to go through it methodically. You know, if you have an alarm system that's totally failed, like I said, like I said in that one slide, you can eliminate uh, big chunks of your loop just by manipulating a few wires, and let's let's try to get those first ten incubators working properly. Then extend your loop to the next ten, get those working, and so forth and so on. So understanding how the wiring the hatchery is wired up in the system is important to know how you can start, you know, compartmentalizing yeah. things to troubleshoot. Right. And right. Um, what what would be your recommendations for practices on you know uh, routine alarm calibrations or maybe even testing your alarm system? Do you have a, a something you would prefer to see? 
Well, you know, like on the high temp backup alarms, um, I think, uh, well, I know our, our current consultants recommend that they calibrate the high temp backup alarm every six months, but most companies have, have that written right into their SOPs and uh, usually do it a little more often than that. And then what was the other part of the question now? Um, well, it was just like either routine um, testing of it, the calibration of it, or yeah, routine so, testing to make sure it's working. So you, so you have your um, high temp backup alarm mounted on your roof and you've calibrated it and you want to do something to ensure that that thing's working. So next time you empty out that single stage device, let's say you have your incubator set on 101 degrees. Simply just turn your incubator on, change the temperature set point to 101, and that, that incubator should alarm when that incubator hits 101. And if it doesn't, then you probably um, have a bad calibration or something's going on. But Would you have a time frame that you would recommend these being tested on? Monthly, every three months? Well, like you could, you, if you wanted to be, you know, if you wanted a, a peace of mind, you, there would be nothing wrong with testing it every time you set it. You know, every time you empty it out, run it up to one on one and see if it makes the alarm go off. Nothing wrong with that at all. Peace of mind, insurance, right? Yes, sir. Yep. Um, uh, question, kind of a theoretical question, and this is this is kind of, um, you know, from your experience in doing this for a long time. Um, with and you and I have discussed this a little bit with the alarms and or wiring, particularly in the exposure to water, and sometimes we can have issues with that. Um, would it be possible at all to start running some of the wiring underground? What would you see problems with that to keep it away from water? Well, there, there, there can be. I mean, if you run water, I mean, water can get can get anywhere. If, you know. I, 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 don't, I don't prefer wires going underground because that means you, you, you have to have, when you're building the hatchery, all that stuff's poured under concrete. And if you ever have to get at it, it's, it's a problem. I, li I like wiring to be overhead. I mean, water's always going to go down. And if you're overhead, and I also like wiring to be in cable trays where you can actually get to it. But a lot of hatcheries are run conduit. Mm -hmm. That makes it and just harder. making sure the conduit or systems you have is waterproof. But yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, another question: Could you connect like your alarm systems and you know, just from your experience in wiring, to like a lighting system? Like you know, you've also got alarms going off, but you've got like a, a colored bulb going off, or if you got high temp, it's you know, yeah. red, something to kind of help with that. I I had I actually. Uh, within the last couple of years, I actually have a hatchery that I built where the their alarm systems are connected to uh, to an intercom, and they also have uh, strobe lights connected to it. Works fine. So there's there's again there's a lot of options. Yeah, we strobe can, lights, colored lights. Yeah, we, we the intercom can, whatever. Pretty much, if if you can dream it up, well, you know, I I can call. Uh, so, I, you know, we, we have people we can talk to up in our engineering department. We can figure something out. You know, if you come up with something so crazy that can't be done, maybe we have somebody um, figure, figure it out. out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, question from a, um, from a hatchery manager, uh, theoretical or just your thoughts on it. You know, it says the aim of a hatchery manager should be to limit critical arms you know, to say one a month, I mean, is that feasible? To limit what now? Critical alarm, so one incidence a month of your critical alarm. I mean, do you think that's feasible? Well, it could, you know, with proper maintenance, proper PM, and, you know, it's, it's possible, I, I suppose. I'm so not the, equipment, gonna... the equipment's set up to do a job, and as long as we maintain the inputs on it and everything, it's, it's possible to do, yeah. um, but human error gets in the way many times. Yeah. <laughs> because like I said, you, you, uh, the difference between a good hatchery and a great hatchery is always going to be the people. You know, we, you, can, you can put, you know, we, we make real good uh, incubation equipment, but if you don't have quality people running it, it's yeah. That, just, yeah, we've seen, yeah, we've seen that. We've, yeah. 
we've all seen that some of the limitations you have so in, in testing alarms back to, back to that again another question says have you seen um somebody that had a system set up for testing their alarms and, and what you think works best and, and somebody maybe a, a serious protocol timing or whatever testing them have you seen something that you just really like the way somebody has that set up for testing, or testing the alarms yeah well, yeah. I, I like the system we have, we currently have in place. Any any uh, James Webb machine, you just walk up to the machine, say you're getting, you just set some eggs, and it should be part of your SOP. Somebody somebody needs to be hitting that uh, test alarm button on the incubator, and when they hit that test button, they the horn should go off. And this is especially critical if you're running the old, uh, you know, you have a hatchery um, running the old parallel wired alarm systems. Because like I said, that system's already not so much, uh, not as fail safe as a series wired one. And a wire or anything can come loose in that situation and you would never know it until you hit the test button on the alarm, on the incubator or hatcher. So I, I recommend, you know, you, the machine has an alarm test button, use it. You use it when, when you're setting eggs, especially in the platinum, some setting eggs, use it and test it. One final question. Um, so, and this goes back to kind of a troubleshooting thing. If somebody has a, has an alarm, but this, but it doesn't work properly or one machine continually has a problem on it. What, I mean, how would you troubleshoot that? You've got, you think your alarm's working right and your one machine just keeps alarming, but you're not necessarily seeing the cause of it. How would you troubleshoot that? Well, if you have one machine, if you, you have it isolated down to one machine, um, and it's alarm, if it's a series wired uh, alarm system, and you have it isolated down to one machine, the, the, the only thing it can be is either you have a loose wire at that machine or that relay is bad. And that's so really all it can be, or the wire's cut. Yeah, limited down, down to that. Because remember in the series wired alarm system, your voltage has to go, has, you, has to make it from the alarm box out through each and every incubator and back to the alarm box and hold that uh, relay open. Otherwise, you're going to sound your horn. So if anything happens at any one of the incubators or hatchers, as far as a, a relay goes bad, a wire goes bad, gets disconnected, you're going to have an, uh, an alarm on the, on the series wired system. Okay, one, one, one final question. We'll let you just voice your opinion right here. You've done, you've, you've installed a lot of incubators, hatcheries, alarms, wiring of all different types, and you've done some troubleshooting going back on that. What, um, what is the most common cause when you're having to go back and troubleshoot alarm systems? What, what would you kind of lump it into as like the most common, biggest causative factor that's having you to go back and do some troubleshooting in alarm system? Well, either uh, somebody somebody has uh, is, is, um, messed with the machine as far as maybe pulled the relay. If they pull the uh, the alarm relay out and just you know set it down and eat, you're going to get an alarm. Or somebody's pulled the uh, somebody got tired of hearing the horn, they pulled the relay out of the alarm control panel or something like that. But overall, when I'm starting up new hatcheries, far and away the biggest problem. Is going to, especially given the size of some of these hatcheries that we're building nowadays, you know, 100, 150, some of them approaching 200 machines. 90% of the time, when you're trying to fire that alarm system up for the first time, it's going to be insufficient power supply. That's why I always, I, I have one of those uh, little boxes that you use to jump start cars with. And when the first time I'm testing an alarm system, trying to prove that I have continuity through that long loop, I'll hook it up to that thing, and it's always got enough amps to make it out and back home to the latch relay. But yeah, insufficient power supply will get you every time on this system. Some of the newer, bigger ones. Oh yeah. yeah. And then the other thing you said on there too is a lot of somebody did this or somebody did that. The people factor plays into it a lot. Right. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you, Vance, for uh, this very informative. Um, webinar talking about alarms and wiring and helping us to keep our hatcheries running um, properly and efficiently and, and avoiding the pitfalls of, of any failures in there. 
So again, if you have any additional questions, email them to webinars at jamesway.com. We'll um, get those answered for you. Um, again, next week we have a webinar on